listen up. Y'all, it's the queen of automation, Megan Donnelly, here to give you inspiration. Founders and business owners gather round. I'ma show you how to build systems that are astound. Streamline your processes, no need for complications. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Queen of Automation podcast, where we talk about why technology is only good when it works and how I help you make it work. Today we're getting a little geeky and a little techie with Clint Taylor, the owner and founder of Datality. Clint has over 14 years of experience in the technology world and spent 10 years as a global CTO for a top behavioral science company, increasing their operational efficiency by over 300%. Boom! Welcome, Clint. Say hi to everyone and let us know where you're tuning in from. All right. I'm, I'm here from uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, which uh, is a state. It's, uh, it's about 45 minutes north of Boston on the seacoast. Oh my God, that is so funny. How have we not had this conversation? I grew up in Vermont. No way. I love 20 it. years. I was born and raised in Brattleboro, Vermont. And That's I bet funny. you are probably one of the only people that I can say that name to and go, yeah, I know where that is. I, I, I know about where that is, yeah. I, I don't understand how people think that New Hampshire and Vermont are not states. Like, where where did you where did you go to school? Like, it, it's, it's clearly on the map. Come on, people. Exactly. Anyway, we don't have to get into that. So I'm super excited that you're here because you and I share a kindred connection for data and all things technology. And so this is going to be really fun and exciting. First, I like to start off with talking about work-life balance because i don't believe in it i don't believe that there is a work-life balance i think it's all just life mm -hmm. and i would love to hear your perspective on it um because i really feel this day and age like that is <laughs> that is it like for entrepreneurs there's no such thing as work-life balance there is life and you're either working on your business or you're having a personal life or you're doing both and they're intertwined Absolutely. I, uh, I was late for a meeting like a few years ago with a potential investor and said, I'm sorry, you know, personal takes over. My son needed help with something. He said, don't even worry about it. He says, you know, people who don't understand that business is personal and personal is business probably don't do very well at either of them. And I took that with me for, for forever so far. Um, hopefully not forever. Um, hopefully I get another <laughs> few days in me. But yes. I completely uh, agree with that. I, I think the concept of work-life balance, like you need to give it a name uh, in order to have some kind of a topic to focus on. But, uh, but I do think that it all comes down to life. Uh, I don't know how people can sort of separate, hey, this is work Clint versus personal Clint. Of course, you have to act a certain way. But to a degree, you have to be comfortable with the way you work being a natural extension of yourself. Uh, it's your empathy, it's your altruism, uh, it's your grit, it's your friendliness, right? Uh, it's yeah. your technical expertise in our case. But I, I, de I definitely agree with you. It's weird. To, to me, it's one of those things where it's like, okay, if there's this concept called work-life balance and it makes people happier, it makes people better, which makes then the people around them happier and better, fine, call it work-life balance. Right, That's call cool. it whatever you want. Absolutely. Yep. I think that's the biggest thing too. And I'm, I'm glad you said that because I think the biggest thing about it is call it whatever the heck you want. Just do you, yep. right? Like if you need to call it work-life balance, call it work-life balance. If you need to call it something else or you don't call it anything at all and you just call it life, do that. But I think the concept is stop following what everyone else is telling you it's supposed to be and do what's right. best for you. And I think that's kind of where I'm coming from. It's like, I don't care what you call it. If, if you need to give it a name, I just want people to follow themselves and be true to themselves instead of following the sheep. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, you, you can tell, and you can tell the people who probably uh, to some degree or another are not happy with what they're doing because they're yeah. the ones who lash out at you for perhaps, <laughs> you know, 9.9% .9 work and no life. And I actually had someone do that more or less. I was, mm -hmm. I, I posted on like Facebook how I was hustling on a Saturday and I got a picture of me and my laptop and, you know, my little rocking chair or whatever. And I was just going to town on a Saturday morning and he started, he, he got back to me uh, publicly with like, this is the problem with, with people today. And, and, you know, and he's like, you know, people don't take time to relax and you know the antithesis of what life should be. 
And I'm like, bro, just you got. How does he know you didn't relax on Tuesday? Right. That's a really good point. And and, <laughs> and my response is kind of like, okay, bro, don't do it. Then. Okay, don't do it. I'll yeah. do it. All right. And then yeah. I had like a real a, another friend of mine who understands like the entrepreneurship I'm going through, and she was so scared that he was going to bring me down. She just railed on him. It was it was awesome. But they started going like, back and forth. Popcorn, like. Well, sort of, but I was kind of cringing because it's on it's on my profile, and I got this yeah, big argument going on. Right. Yeah, and I'm like, listen, man, listen, all right, beach, fine. No, no one ever those things in your hand, the technology in your hand, the technology that you know that's under your feet when you're surfing. I'm sorry, uh, no one, no one came up with that just sitting around drinking the butts off, okay, uh, and doing nothing. All right. Yeah, exactly. Well, and that's how you got the things in your hand. That's how you got to the beach, right? That's how you drove there. <laughs> People weren't just sitting there doing nothing Saturdays and Sundays. Hey, here's a combustion engine. That doesn't happen. The best part about this story is that he's calling you out on LinkedIn on a Saturday when he is on LinkedIn on a Saturday. This is on Facebook. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, that's same difference. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it doesn't it, matter it, what it, platform it, you're on. So totally. for anybody who's listening out there, I mean, we talk about this stuff all the time. And anybody who's in my network knows I talk about this all the time. First of all, Clint owns a business. He is an entrepreneur. He owns his own company. His weekend could be Tuesday and Wednesday. It could be Monday and Tuesday. It could be Thursday and Friday. It could be Thursday and Sunday. It could be whatever freaking days he wants. There's no such thing as weekends either when you're an entrepreneur. You work when you have to. And you take off when you want to. The whole mm -hmm. point of building a business and being an entrepreneur is to work when and where you want, with who you want, and you get to pick and choose if you want to work from the beach on a Saturday. Like, that's just yeah. ridiculous to me. Like, if you're not doing that, how is that our fault? Like, don't call us out because we're living the life. Like, the whole point is to build a life that you love. And that includes work because you have to eat. Mm -hmm. which means people have to pay you money. You know, there's all these things like money is a tool, but good Lord, that's funny to me. Yeah. Yeah. Story. And honestly, since we're on that, su that subject, it's to me, it's akin to like, if you're telling your friends, you know, you're out of the bar or whatever restaurant, you're telling them what you're doing. Yeah, I'm working on this and uh, spending all night, all weekend, you know, working on my startup. I'm programming this and I'm calling people at night, nine, 10 at night. And, and the response sometimes is not, it's not snarky, but it, it's defensive, but it doesn't mean to be. It's like, that's crazy. You are crazy, man. And it's like, I, I don't, I, I don't harp on it, but to a degree internally, I'm like, don't say that. All right. By saying yeah, that, you know, you're, giving no yourself, you're giving yourself an excuse uh, to back out of you doing it yourself. Right. You're right. like actually making an excuse yeah. for yourself saying that. Uh, that is crazy. Therefore, I am not going to do that. No, just understand that you could do this if you wanted to. You could succeed this way if you wanted to. And just say that you don't want to. But don't call someone else crazy and don't make it look like they're a lunatic for working, you know, 70, 80 hours a week to fulfill their dreams for whatever chemical or whatever past traumatic, whatever reason they have. Let them do it and just just accept the new tech that they create for you accept the, you know the new engineering that they create for you because they're doing it all right and just just walk away and smile it's so great because i love listening to you tell these stories because first of all i thankfully get to interact with clint in one of our favorite networking groups brand built we're just going to shout them out because they're awesome yeah and they we so we talk about this kind of stuff all the time in this group and it's just hilarious to me because I am now in this situation where I build out these systems and operations for people and we do it in two week sprints, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like we're hustling and we're working all the time for two weeks. And then guess what I get to do? I get to take as many weeks off as I want because that person just paid me five plus figures mm -hmm. for one project. How you live and you get to choose do i hustle for two weeks for a little bit more like more hours absolutely and then i take two weeks off and i have conversations like this and i run podcasts and i pick on the people in the networking group and i have meme wars and i take my kids to great america we go to the beach we... why would i choose 
to sit at a cubicle in an office in corporate America, nine to five, eight to five, whatever it is every day. And I have to request my time off and I have to, instead of choosing my own schedule, Mm -hmm. my schedule is what I want it to be. Yeah. And, and and the thing is the cubicle is okay for the right people. And and that is one thing that I try to tell, I try to tell people in my, my past life previous employment yeah listen some people just want to leave at five and go coach the little league team and that is fine exactly let them do it right but don't go push them to be something that you know they're not going to be right yep and they like they like not having the responsibility of being the boss they like not having the responsibility of doing the math and figuring out the bills and they just want to go to their job and then go home they want to go to Mm -hmm. their job and go home and that's just and that's fine. That's so fine. They're doing what's right for them, but then they need to leave you alone because you're doing what's right for you and what mm-hmm. you want to do. Totally. I don't know. The whole thing is crazy to me because there's is there's just so such a broad spectrum of people, right? And and they're all out there and they just are arguing with each other like about what is the best way. There is no right way. You have to do what works for you. Mm-hmm. Ignore all the crap and just do you. Like, it's not that hard. Just figure out what you want. Absolutely. So let's get, let's get a little nerdy because I'm super excited to hear the Daytality story. <laughs> um, and obviously, please, please give a little intro from your background. Um, but I'm, I'm so excited to talk about Daytality because it is such a cool product. But I'm going to let you tell the story. and I'm going to let you pimp it out and tell everybody all about it. Uh, but I want to know, for me, I, of course, want to know about the geeky operations side of the business and what you're kind of what you're running on. Like, are, what platforms are you running on? How are you getting customers? All of the geeky kind of operations and systems and processes that make we'll you We'll definitely tick, get right? to that. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, so I've been creating enterprise tech stacks for 25 years, um, which shows my age. And so, uh, <laughs> like you said, I was a CTO in market research for, for 10 years. I co-invented a technology that quantifies the subconscious drivers of human behavior. And we Okay, now (laughs) say that again in layman's terms for people who don't know what we're talking about. (laughs) We we, we associate the the emotions that are evoked when you're looking at a brand or a product. Bingo. Yeah. Hey, uh, guys out there who's listening, guys, girls, people's humans, remember how people are talking about building a brand or you're talking about building a business and they tell you it's all about emotion. It's all about emotion. Listen to Clint. He's going to tell you why it's all about emotion. It's definitely mostly about emotion. The problem is you can't, you can't consciously detect it. And that is the big problem. You you can't ask people what they feel. You have to run them through uh, exercises and detect how they feel. But anyway, that's, that's my past life. The point is we're sitting on yeah, so, so, so we co-invent, co-invented this um, and rolled it out in 2013, 2014, and we're sitting on like half a billion points of data over the course of you know eight or nine years. And a lot of that data we owned, a lot of that data we used internally. And basically, I was like, why is there no effective eBay for research data out there? Like, we're not going to go create like a Shopify storefront and sell our data. That's not our brand, right? Um, and, and we're not going to create a SaaS dashboard. That's not what we do. We do research, you know? And so... The more I looked into it, the economics of it, the more I got a lot of head nods in the industry. And it's, it's, like, it's like $140 billion industry market research. Yep. But it's like the same 200 people. It's, it's weird. Um, it's very kind of incestuous. You see, you see the same 200 people at every event. Zoom info. And, yeah. Yeah. And everybody's like, yeah, there's a need for this. I don't know why it hasn't been done yet. And so it, that's a little bit scary where it's like, okay, it's like, what am I missing? All right. If it hasn't been done yet, what am I missing? I effectively, you know, cut to the cut to now. I created it. I created this marketplace that was actually built on blockchain, way down deep. But it is economically, effectively, an eBay for research data. It's like a Craigslist for yeah. expert collected research data. Now there are other options out there where it's more of a white glove approach, where you know you're talking to a business development representative, you're talking to an account manager, and they're going to help you find that data, and they're going to use their researchers and get that data for you. But you know, when we talk about uh, to the nature of your podcast, right? Automation. We automate the monetization of expertly collected data. That's what we do because that's what we had in my previous life, and we couldn't really monetize it very easily. Um, so we we automate the monetization of it, um, which then automates the acquisition of it. 
uh, by making both faster and cheaper. And so if you want to engage, you want to monetize your data right now, you're either pivoting your tech really hard or you're going to pay like you know forty, fifty thousand dollars in order to do it. On the on the on the uh, on the buy side, you're going to pay like you're going to do the same. Like you're going to pay forty, fifty thousand dollars to get someone on the phone, or you're going to pivot your tech to you know to work with Snowflake or AWS. And I'm like, why can't people just post files, just post CSVs, post Excel files? And so, I mean, automation in this case it means we're saving people time, which on both sides of a transaction for data in data markets, it it means saving money, which allows Huge. more participants in the market because the barriers have been lowered, right? It's no longer I need to spend you know twenty, forty thousand dollars to engage in selling my data. I can do it in ten minutes, right? And and if I put a title, I put a description on it, I tag it, I provide a sample to show you the structure, and there's more to it that I'll tell you. But what it becomes is a flywheel effect. So yep. the more supply out there, it begets more uh, buyers because they see, wow, there's opportunity here. And then the more people that buy, the more attractive it is for the sellers out there because they see how much money's rolling through here. And ideally, we do things right. We get that critical mass. We activate this phenomenon called network effects, which you know, just the sheer number of, of participants on both sides of the transaction become make the other side more attractive. And they go like this and this and this, right? Mm -hmm. um, same as Airbnb, same as Uber, right? Um, you can't have Uber without drivers, can't have Airbnb without places to stay. But in both cases, you know, they had, you had someone who had something of value. Um, Airbnb, it's, I have the space, you know, Uber, I have, yep. I have a vehicle and time, right? Um, in this case, we're talking about latent asset data that, that expert researchers have on the books. They use it for another purpose, but it's sitting there back of the warehouse per se, it just collecting dust and decaying and losing value. We we made it easy for people to post and sell. I'm gonna jump in for a second because yes. I want to for the people like because I geek out on all of this stuff. Like I said, I geek out listening to you talk because I love all of this stuff. Like it's just so exciting to me. Data first off is ungodly expensive. It's just ungodly expensive. And like you said, there's only like a handful of people doing it and they're making so much money off selling data so let's break it down a little bit for the people that don't understand all the super techie stuff that you just said right like let's give them an example so let's just like teeny mini money mo pick an example and then talk about what your system is doing like what kinds of data are you getting where are you getting it from like well if you can even kind of break it down in layman's terms like that so that yeah someone who doesn't understand the value understands the value if that makes sense absolutely yeah so here's an example so in in, in we're focusing on market research just mm -hmm. so you know so i'm going to say a couple of market research terms there's something called panel Right now, a panel of people is of people who effectively take a survey for you, right? Yep. But it's not just people who just take a survey. You know, true, false, one rate one to ten. So I'm an organization, and I'm going to create this. I have this idea to create a dashboard for all of what's going on exactly right now on Amazon. I want. To, I'm going to tell you who's buying, what they're buying, where they're buying from, how much they're paying, and everything. Right. So I'm going to get fifty thousand people. I'm going to pay them a couple bucks a day. I'm going to put an app on their phone and say, "You're going to give us your Amazon." Uh, usage data, right, from your from your phone. And I'm going to take that data and I'm going to show people what's happening in real time. I'm going to take it, I'm going to run it through my own system, right? And then right away, I'm going to automate it to these dashboards. And anyone in the world is going to be able to see, they sign up, give me a subscription, right? They're going to see what's going on in Amazon and they're interested. You know, if they're selling uh, widgets, they're going to see the widget market and then see, okay, here's the people are paying, what, what, they're paying, what they're paying for, how it's described. I can tweak my product offering so that I can make it better, right? So that's that's a, that's a model, right? Taking data from people, fifty thousand people, each with a mobile phone, and creating this dashboard. Awesome. But they're collecting that data, and that data sits, right? And and they keep it, right? It's not real time. It's a month old. It gets three months old. It gets six months yeah. old. So for their business model, right, it becomes less valuable. People aren't as interested in the past in six months. They want to know right now what's happening right now. That's they want just, actual real time, real right. time. Yeah, yeah, and that meets their needs. But the thing is, in market research especially, uh, when you get six months, 12 months, 24 months of data, 
those are cycles that show trends in there, right? Yeah. Now it may not be right for that business, but now, but you know, they have their primary revenue stream. That's their that's their platform. That's their SaaS platform using real time data. What do we do with this data that we that we've collected, which we don't really use anymore? We want an easy way to monetize it, and so it, it comes down to a data monetization strategy where we go to them, and we say, listen, if you have twenty four months of data or twelve months of data, um, we have this platform, and our target audience are the people who need those cycles of data in order to make yep. go to market decisions right i want to yep. know you know what the uh, what the widget market looked like over the course of 2023 because i'm going to enter that market i want to know what i should price it at um, what the promotion should be what the product should be and everything so that's where we need to make it very low uh, barriers to entry to both monetize that data because this is not these companies main revenue driver we need to make it easy for them or else they're never going to do it right and the same, uh, same no, other side of the coin, if you will, need to make it so that the transaction cost of this data is as low as possible, which means you're not talking to a BDR, you're not getting a demo, you're not getting pitched, you're looking at a title, a description, a structure, and saying, is that enough information for me to spend a few thousand dollars on this data, to make a go-to-market decision where I'm going to make millions? And the answer yep. is yes, uh, it is. You just have to structure the transaction the right way so that everyone feels safe and so that it's not totally bloated. And last thing, I don't know, I'm, I'm talking like a mile a minute because I love this stuff. Right, but, I love it. <laughs> yeah, but, but what we're doing here is when you look at, everyone's doing AI. AI is like, this is funny, you can cut this out, but AI is like, it's like teenagers having sex. Like everyone says they're doing it, but not, <laughs> doing it. No, not cutting it out. That's doing it right, you know? Um, and so, so, but the point is AI and compute power has, have never made it easier for people to comprehend raw data. Yeah. And it's just getting easier. That means you don't need a white glove approach all the time, right? That market is widening. Uh, the people yeah. who need assistance and the people who don't, because AI is there to help them, right? Yeah. They can get this raw data and we want to be there for them to just transact the data not pay the overhead, not pay $50,000, not subscribe for 12 months because that's the only way that, you know, uh, yeah, these companies, the, the oligopoly can make money off you is if you commit for a high ticket or a long commitment. We want to flip it on its head, offer this data to millions in a way that is very efficient and we make a living and they get the data that they could not have acquired before. And the sellers get to monetize their data in a way that it doesn't uh, sit at the back of the warehouse, if you will. I'm so excited that you chose Amazon as the um, as the example because I have a love hate relationship with Amazon, which anyone from the technology world does because Amazon is Amazon. Their user experience is like the worst user experience in the entire world. Their UI is horrible, but yet they offer two day free shipping. So, I'm ordering from Amazon, cool. even though I hate shopping on their website, right? Like whatever. But I'm so happy that you chose that example and then chose to talk about trending data because for everybody who maybe isn't a big business owner who is just starting out or for anyone who's just a smaller business owner, trending data, I'm just going to say this one time. Maybe I'll say it a few times because I'm just going to repeat it. So you really get it in your head. Trending data is so much more important to your business than what's happening two seconds from now, two seconds before. The mm. last three months, the last six months, the last 12 months, the stories the data tells on trending data to help you actually create a strategic decision for your business is so much better than if you're looking at the past 14 days or the past 30 days. Who cares? You need to look farther out because if you're making decisions on the past seven days, that's a really bad idea if you are looking to sustainably grow your business. And anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there because that is an amazing example. And Amazon's a really great example because there's so many people out there right now that are selling on Amazon. I mean, the, the F, what is it? F, I, why do I always forget those three letters? The, the sellers on Amazon, what are they called? FDAs? What, whatever. It doesn't matter. I have no idea. Yeah. People who sell like drop shipping, selling, whatever. It doesn't matter. The Amazon sellers of the world. There's so many of them. Mm -hmm. Like you don't even know who you're buying from anymore, whether it's China or Asia or 
Russia or Texas or Australia. Yeah. Like, I mean, there's so many people selling products on Amazon from gosh knows where. That's a whole nother soapbox. <laughs> anyway, this has been really, really exciting. I'm so, so happy. And I can't wait to watch this journey because this is this is newer for you, right? Like not not like yesterday new, but this is a new venture for Clint. And I can't wait to just continue to watch the journey and continue to watch you grow. So what I want you to do is tell everyone how they can find you, tell everyone how they can kind of continue to watch the journey with you because you are very much building in public and talking about mm -hmm. your journey along the way. And it's a really exciting journey to follow if you're in to the business world, right? And all the geeky stuff that happens. So tell everybody where they can find you. Yeah, the best place to find me is on LinkedIn. Go there, connect with me. I will connect with you, not a problem. <laughs> You'll get to see me you know, post about Datality. You'll see the connection from me to Datality. Absolutely. That's really the best way to go about it. You know, if you head to app.datality.com, and it's not Data Liddy, it's Datality. Check it out. You know, we have, uh, we have you know, real time chat there that contacts a person. Sometimes it's me. Yep. But if you have questions about what we have on there, by all means, you know, we just want to help. So what we're going to be, we're going to end up being this sort of dating site, right? Yeah, you have, it's so yeah, great. Yeah, you have this side over here who has something that this side wants, and then boom, get together, right? Um, and that's exactly. going to be great. But right now, we're, we're kind of playing matchmaker, you know? And so we're putting these two together. We're finding out, you know, what kind of data is out there in, in abundance. We're finding out what kind of needs that people have um, and helping them get together and then by doing that, you know, we're, we're improving our user experience. I'm still listening. Keep going. It's recording. It's fine. Yeah. They're just so loud. By doing that, we're, uh, we're improving our user experience uh, and sharpening our product market fit. So by all means, uh, if you don't see something on the marketplace, we're just scratching the surface. Ask, ask me on LinkedIn. Ask via the chat. You're probably going to get me anyway. Uh, and, <laughs> and totally happy to do this. This is just as much of a, like a, of an exploration mission and mm -hmm. identifying where are the big you know areas we're going to hit with this. We have great ideas so far, but I just love talking to people about it. And I love helping solve the problems too. And it's a really great way for anyone who's interested in becoming involved in just kind of business research data in general, right? Like, because it's, really great it's a really great way to affect how things are being done not just in your own industry but for market research right like putting you put crap in you get crap out so clint's really trying to make that cleaner because mm -hmm. there's so much for all of the good data out there there's three times as much bad data and people are buying it and then they're using that to shape business strategy and it's bad it's just bad news so jump on linkedin go check out clint go talk to him reach out to him ask him questions and it's it's such a good he's just such a great guy i'm so excited thank you i'm really glad that you were able to jump on today um we had a few missteps and kept re you know rescheduling but we got it we got it done we're here that's a wrap and remember technology is only good when it works See you next week.